All right, welcome everyone to LA Excites Live. We are here with a very, very special guest. This is our very first episode. I'm also here with a co-host, Robin. What's up, brother? Hello. How are you guys? And our guest today is a sports psychologist, or should I say quantitative psychologist, who specializes in sports psychology. And his name is what? Dr. Mark Otten. <laughs> Hello. What is sports psychology? Uh, it is the uh, study. Uh, so it's basically um, anything that you might think psychology is, but applied to sports situations. So you could t think about um, developmental psychology or social psychology, these different uh, clinical psychologies, the most popular. All my students want to be clinical psychologists. But a clinical sports psychologist is someone who uh, counsels athletes uh, on issues that are unique to them. So sweet. that's the short answer. So your PhD is in quantitative psychology, so that's like statistics, I'm assuming. It's, uh, it's embarrassing. Why is that people embarrassing? Are, people are tuning out right now. They think I'm going to talk about stats. No, no. Why? Well, that's not embarrassing at all. Okay. In fact, uh, we need statistics, so it gives us some more uh, answers to life. You know I, what I'm saying? Theoretically, yes. So what classes do you teach here? So I teach the statistics classes, but I also teach a senior level sports psychology class. Um, yeah. Very cool. So tell us about your research. My research is, so uh, over the last, whatever, 10 years, I've studied performance under pressure. So um, how athletes can be successful under pressure. A lot of psychologists have assumed that athletes get to a pressure situation and they're going to choke. And there's that term is in the literature. It's the choking under pressure. So um, they focus on trying to prevent choking. But then when I was originally looking through it, I was like, well, we have all these examples. Um, Joe Montana in the 1980s, Michael Jordan in the 1990s, um, people, who, athletes who were successful under pressure, they were clutch performers. Yeah, so I come at it from like a positive psychology angle, like, you know, how can we help athletes and everybody be more successful under pressure and not just avoid getting anxious and falling off a cliff, but actually um, uh, seizing the moment, getting better under pressure than they normally would perform. Okay, sorry, I have, I have no background in psychology, but from what, you're, from what I understand that you're saying, there's generally two types of performers, I guess, in, in that sense, in, in sports. is one who are much better with uh, kind of less pressure, right? They have a lot of time to prepare and so on, and the others who are better with just kind of being under pressure, and that's when they show their greatest. Is that? Yeah, I mean, you could even you could even look at athletes in their careers, and some athletes will like perform a choke a few times or something like this, and then suddenly figure it out. So it could be like a, an athlete who performs poorly then learns how to perform better, or vice versa. Or it could be different athletes. One is good under pressure typically, and one is not. So you can compare different athletes. You can also like teach somebody who's struggling under pressure to actually get better and there's a middle ground too where like you could perform as you normally would like there's pressure and you're like okay i just i'm playing about the same as i did before but that's rare i feel like compared to changes and psychologically when there's pressure when there's anxiety when you're giving a public speech when you're performing in the super bowl you're going to feel something and you can't ignore that something and so it's how you deal with that something that is what we study so you discover that essentially in order to be a clutch performer, you have to find, or you have to have, cultivate, I should say, confidence and perceived control of the situation. That's true. So can you talk a little bit about that? Maybe let's apply it to, you know, uh, the example of a game-winning shot, maybe in the NBA. So first, if you could describe your findings. and please. Yeah, so uh, my dissertation, we found perceived control or intuitive control were the terms we used. And basically, it's like, you're getting ready to, what was the game-winning shot? Is that what we're doing? Yeah, so yeah. the game-winning shot. Uh, you're um, getting ready for the game. So um, we just saw this in women's basketball in, in the um, national championship game. The same player whose name, don't ask me to pronounce, um, uh, um, she had a very long first uh, last name. Um, anyway, Notre Dame uh, won the national championship for women's basketball, and she just won both games at the buzzer with game-winning shots. It was amazing. So what was she thinking? She was probably thinking like, uh, well, she was probably freaking out, first of all. But then second of all, you have to use that freaking out feeling in, for positive. And so uh, the control thing is like, I, I'm, I want the ball and it, I just, if I shoot it, I know it's going to go in. And it's intuitive and it's hard to measure. Like for psychologists, it's really hard to capture that. But 
Um, but we've tried to with our research. So that was the biggest thing that we found was um, I just know it's I'm going to be awesome and the, everyone's going to love me. And then you go forward with that mentality and it helps you out. So that being said, you're Kobe Bryant. Yes. A few years back because now he's retired. But you're Kobe Bryant and you got yeah. 0.4 seconds left on the clock. Yeah. You got to make that game winning shot. Yeah. First, he has to have perceived control, and then the confidence. By the way, I'm a, I'm a Sacramento Kings fan. I could not stand Kobe, uh, but he was good. Continue. Okay. Yes. Sorry. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but let's still say it's Kobe. Yeah. How are we going to actually teach him to have perceived control? That's the part that I'm missing here. Yeah. Because people are just not born with perceived control, that I can actually right. control this situation, that I can actually yeah. make this shot. The thing about Kobe was that he wanted to take the shot. He didn't necessarily always make it, but he always took it. Like he was like so confident in himself that he was just like everyone else get out of the way. This is my game, my sport, you know. So that that's part of it. I think it's it's confidence. You mentioned that is a big thing. So how do you build confidence? Well, I mean, you're, if you're a beginner, it's not easy. If you're uh, experienced, it's much easier. You can draw on past success. That's the biggest thing. But if you haven't had success, you need to set yourself up set, set yourself up for it. So suppose you're learning to play basketball and you're trying to get in a game. Well, you maybe select a weaker opponent for a while or something like that to generate, like engineer the situation so that you are going to have success. And even if you're a beginner, you can do that. You can lower the basket. You can you know, uh, do some things to, to help yourself gain confidence and then uh, slowly build that such that when you get to the big game, you've already built enough confidence that you're, you're at that point where then you feel like it's going to be awesome and you're going to win. So you're saying that uh, some, a clutch performer isn't something that you're just born with. So you have to put yourself in a situation where mm -hmm. the, you were extremely nervous and then just learn to function mm -hmm. under that nervousness such that when mm -hmm. it comes time to be in, in you know, yeah. When you time to clutch, right? You're you're used to the pressure. You're used to the feeling of being nervous, right. and it doesn't distract you. Yeah, and you also right. use the nerves because like these symptoms are neutral, right? You're feeling nerves, but that has a negative connotation. What about excitement? What about butterflies in your stomach? What about anticipation? You know, these are more positive ways of saying it. So then, it's a physiological sensation, right? Your sweaty palms, your your um, heart rate goes up, things like that. So it's how you interpret that. That's the biggest thing. Um, so, I mean, I think also exposure to it helps, but one thing athletes do a lot and sports psychologists do is imagery. So that you might, I'm, I've never been, um, does I'm that not, really work? I imagine I'm going to make that game winning shot and it happens. Yeah, it sometimes works. It, it depends on how good you are at it, uh, how much you believe in it. For me personally, I've used it a little bit more now that I've learned about it, uh, for myself, uh, when I play tennis and things like that. But um, but, you know, if you have a mental plan in your head and a picture, a realistic picture of what's going to happen, then that leads you to better control, feelings of control. You and they've found I mean? this statistically to be true? Yeah, I mean, sports psychologists have done lots of imagery studies and run people through these experiments and found um, pretty consistently that they work. Although we do have um, this thing called publication bias in psychology these days where let's say you do a study you find a significant result, you're more likely to get it published and get it, you become famous. If you don't find something, you doesn't, nobody knows about it because it doesn't get out there in the research. So there's probably plenty of imagery studies also that have not worked. We just don't know. <laughs> nobody talks about them because they never got them published. You know That's I mean? very so. unfortunate. So we were talking about imagery earlier and um, we were kind of talking about this during our break. So I wanted to bring up imagery in the sports that I do, specifically board sports such as sports snowboarding surfing skating whatever, whatever not not is. boring sports not board boarding. sports yes board sports yes um things that involve planks of shapes and sizes but very <laughs> um generally i like the speed of them that's that's my um and my the appeal to me and uh for those sports, when you're trying, specifically, let's talk about snowboarding because it's the one that I have the most experience with and, and where it makes sense. When I go for a new trick or even one that I've landed multiple times, usually what I'll do is I, I see it in my head before I you know start kind of going down the hill. And then it's, if I don't, if on the way down, I think about a misstep that might happen, there's a very, very high chance that that misstep will happen. It's mm -hmm. it's about, you have to really be, you know, it's that confidence, but you also have to really think about, well, this is what I'm gonna do. Because with the speed, any slight deviation is is punished mm -hmm. greatly. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, would you, is that what, when you say imagery, is that what you're thinking about, this, this, this premeditation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you kind of have to map it out in your head sometimes. I mean, you can, 
if you're really confident, you don't necessarily need imagery because you know that whatever happens, you're going to be fine. Um, so that's why, like for me, I don't always recommend imagery, but um, when, when you're talking about something that happens really fast and you don't necessarily practice it all the time, right, or you're on a new course, let's say, something like that, um, you want to rehearse that you want to plan for it and i think imagery is good imagery a lot of times you're you're actually acting it out in your living room and you're trying to like um you know simulate the smells and the senses the different things that are going to have the temperature in the air things like that and the more realistic it is i think the more likely it is to be applicable when you get actually on the slope and so you're, and so you're actually approximating as, m as much as you can the, the exact situation mm -hmm. We know you're a tennis player. I'm curious, how have you used your research to optimize your own sport performance? It's hard. Psychological I mean, torture. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. It, I just, I often forget my own advice when I'm out there because you get caught in the moment and you get emotional. Uh, you know, an individual sport, it's all you, you know, so when you're playing singles especially. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I kind of have to remind myself things like feel, feel confident you know be feel in control be happy out there be positive most recently i think i needed to remember to to smile have a good time as opposed to getting too serious is that why they tell kids you know most important because every sport i think i've ever been instructed in they every time there's always something along the lines of the most important thing is to have fun and it's because it's just the psychological like no that's person. because uh that's because uh, the adults get scared that the kids are going to get into competition and then they lose and they cry Ah, you know what I mean? Enough, yeah. Um, they, yeah. I never lost. <laughs> <laughs> so the competition, they have it's like competition could go both ways, right? You might have a better time if you win and a worse time if you lose. If you don't compete and you just have fun, then you yeah. just just somewhere in the middle. I enjoy that the most. That's fun. John Wooden, yeah, the very famous NCAA coach, yeah. won many many championships. He came up with something called the pyramid of success, and I'm looking at it right now in my hands. It starts off, uh, the pyramid kind of starts off with friendship, loyalty, cooperation. Then you have uh, alertness. And bottom then, up here? Or? Yeah, I'm going bottom up, bottom up. And then eventually the top is competitive greatness. And Dr. Ott, I'm sorry, Dr. Ott, not Dr. Ott, John Wooden yes. was quoted in saying, Make each day your masterpiece. Happiness begins where selfishness ends. And finally... Be more concerned with your character than your reputation. So he had a lot of wise words. But the question is, are his words substantiated by research? Yes. <laughs> That's it? That's it? Come on, man. Uh, that was the take-home message. Uh, yeah, I mean, we found more support for some of his blocks of his pyramid than others. Um, but the goal, and I say we, I had a... Um, a former student, uh, Deanna Perez, who was the first author on the study, she did like a gigantic literature review, and um, I was just supportive of that. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, so we did a lot of work looking up a lot of articles, and yeah, I, a lot of the the things that he talked about leading competitive greatness is sort of like success under pressure, which is what I've studied. Um, he has poise and confidence in there, um, and those are the things we talked about today. So. Um, yeah, so a lot of his, what he put put out there, just from his own experience, I think, I think it's like um, <laughs> we could put a graphic. A up. little hard to read. But Google yeah, it. It's, it's, yeah, exactly. it's everywhere. Um, yeah, I think what what it, so he, I mean, he was a very successful coach and became a very wise man over the years. And um, a lot of times, what we say as sports psychologists is that coaches are really the best sports psychologists because they know their players the best. They know what's worked and what hasn't worked. Um, and so that's an example of this. I got to say thank you again to Dr. Mark Otten. He has spent his good time here with us this fine afternoon. Again, it was a pleasure. Am I allowed to come back someday? Absolutely. Okay. You are our very first guest, Dr. Otten. Okay. <laughs>